Welcome uh, to Forgotten Nutrition, so traditional health in modern times. Uh, I'll be sharing a little bit about my journey and what I've come to believe as far as health and diving a little bit into the science of it, uh, a little bit about the resources of how to live it and all those kind of things. Um, feel free to ask questions at any point uh, or make note of it for the end and if it makes sense to answer it at the time, I will, otherwise if it's later in the presentation, I might wait a minute um, or, or, or catch it. So here we go. So at the pharmacy, take one a day with tomato and cucumber and he's handing out lettuce. Uh, so I love this, um, of food, food, let food be thy medicine, the medicine be thy food. Uh, but it's not quite that simple, is it? There's, there's a lot more to it and there's a lot of conflicting information out there and it's hard to make sense of it. So uh, hopefully we make a bit more sense of it today. I'll be going back and forth between my notes and the slide. So how this become more and more confusing about how do we eat. So I, I had relatively good health growing up, but had my own struggles, especially with dental caries, um, cavities, depending on what's lacking in your diet, it can manifest in many different ways. And boy, I felt like every time I went to the dentist, I had like three new cavities and drill and hate the dentist. It's awful. So that continued up until I was about like 21, around the time I found this. And ever since I found it, uh, it's been basically zero for going forward. So I was able to heal the um, more mild dental caries that were forming and the, the things that I couldn't quite heal you know, got repaired and then it's been basically free since then. Of, of dental caries, so that's been real nice. Um, so I tried, I tried vegetarian, I tried vegan, I tried all raw, I tried all kinds of things, and you can do several of those quite well. Um, I find it to be more difficult. I wasn't doing it well. I was, you know, it kind of sounds like what you're talking about of cutting out gluten and, and, and dairy or lactose, and but maybe not having the most healthy of things right in its place. So I tried a lot of different things, uh, had all those cavities. I uh, injured my knees. I was more prone to injuries more and more as I, as I got older. And, uh, you know, trying to figure out what's going on. I had energy problems. And uh, before I get into this, I ran into Deep Nutrition. This is a book by a medical doctor who's a cellular biologist. A uh, book by her as well as her husband who's a professional chef. So kind of a cool, kind of a really cool partnership with that is she got deep, deep into what's going on in the body, um, is, you know, in relation to food and nutrition, uh, pulling from her husband with, with uh, recipes and, and promptings about looking closer into food. So deep nutrition, why your genes need traditional food. We'll go into what is traditional food here soon. But that one really started for me. It was the first edition of that which was a lot smaller, so I didn't get quite as intimidated. So I actually <laughs> dove in. If I would have seen that, I'd probably like, nope, thanks. Uh. <laughs> since then, since I've, it's just made such a difference in my life, I've gotten the audio book version of that, which I highly recommend. And uh, it's, it's really a great read. And it's very, very uh, holistic in the description and the science of, of why it works. Um, and then that later led me to Cure Tooth Decay, Remineralize cavities and repair your teeth naturally with good food. Uh, and here's some of the food intake suggestions based on, and, and the, these are all, all these books here as well as this one, which I have uh, elsewhere, they all are in line with each other. They're all, they're all in, the, in line with the work of a doctor named Weston Price, who's a dentist. Uh, and we'll talk more about him in a moment, but Cure Teeth Case. So a few things that it advocates. Uh, Fermented cod liver oil, um, raw milk, kefir, yogurt, uh, high quality land and sea protein, vitamin C rich foods, oysters, clams, fish eggs, bone marrow added to your soup, liver, all these kinds of things. So definitely quite a bit different than what you might think of when you get into mainstream nutrition. A lot of times it's it's don't eat animal products and avoid fat and, and that sort of thing. Um, all right, so Dr. Weston A. Price wrote a book called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Prior to that, he had a son who uh, I 
actually died of a root canal. Mm. You can believe that. And up until then, he was, he was already kind of baffled by how are so many people having so much tooth decay and needing dental um, or root canals. He's like, this seems very unnatural. Why is this happening? And then when his son passed away, he's like, I need to devote my life to this. I need to figure out what's going on. So he traveled the world, uh, something like, I want to say 12 different countries, looking for traditional societies doing food the way that they have for long spans of time. And everywhere he went, they were using slightly different ingredients, but what, he, what was later kind of curated was the four pillars of the human diet, or the four pillars of world cuisine. It's the four sets of strategies that are the same virtually no matter what traditional food culture you enter into. Uh, so strategies of extracting nutrition from the natural world as well as disarming the toxins that are naturally occurring and, and harsh, harsh things in food that are naturally occurring to uh, do the most benefit and the least damage to your body. All right, so he traveled the world and he was thinking, if I can find people with perfect health, or sorry, perfect teeth, then I bet good structure and good health will follow, will, it'll be a package deal. And that's exactly what he found. So he photographed native, native people on their native diets and saw they had very good structure, they formed very well, they had excellent teeth, they had wide jaws, they had um, straight teeth, and were quite healthy. And then conversely with the modern diet, uh, typically a more narrow jaw, crowding of the teeth, the, there wasn't room for the wisdom teeth, so wisdom teeth need to be extracted, um, and typically a lot of dental caries, a lot of cavities. So deep nutrition, so again, this goes into the science, the, the, the why and the how, the why, why it all works, why your genes need traditional food. Uh, food rules, same author, e exactly what to do, um, and it's separated into three sections. It's uh, how to buy, buy natural, uh, how should I cook according to tradition, and how should I eat, eat mindfully. And it goes into a whole bunch of different pieces of that. Very quick, easy read. Each, each chapter is like a page or two. It's really excellent. And then... Nourishing Traditions, and this is a, I love, I love the subtitle, The Cookbook That Challenges Politically Correct Nutrition and the Diet Dicta Breads. How about that? Are talking about the food pyramid? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, the food I've pyramid. Heard it's like, it's, it was completely politically driven. Yeah, uh-huh. And not totally. necessarily good for the body. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah, if, if, those that run the world were to, were to tell you what's really healthy, there'd probably be food riots because there's probably there, there's not enough currently to support that many people. So they need to supplement it by making people eat a whole bunch of grains and seed oils, and um, yeah, it's it's definitely political. It's off, yeah, and that's a big reason why there are there's so much misinformation out there regarding food as well as big business, you know, those who make the seed oils, um, those who produce meat and eggs who want to keep production costs as low as possible, um, making low quality food that, that makes you sick, so, yeah. Uh, anyway, really excellent book. I can't remember if I have it later in the presentation, so while I'm at it, I wanna show you a cool section. It's called Catalog of Vegetables. And so it goes through most of the major vegetables and gives you a quick little blurb about one of the best ways to prepare it. And then slightly more complex recipes of combining it with other things, but I often will just make things separately quite easily uh, in, in the best way to, again, disarm the natural anti-nutrients in plants and in food uh, and pulling out and, and breaking down adequately the nutrition for maximum assimilation. Assimilation uh, and pairing it with, with quality butter, grass fed butter, and a good sea salt, like public sea salt, Himalayan sea salt. So that's a cool category in here. A lot of crazy uh, recipes, things you won't find in most recipe books uh, how to make kefir, how to make fermented condiments. So most condiments that we're familiar with, traditionally, they were fermented. So uh, ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, sauerkraut, originally those were 
fermented and not made with seed oils and uh, much better for you. They, and probiotics, so adding probiotics to what you eat, adding flavor, adding nutrition, rather than just making it yummier, like through, through fake ingredients. So, uh, really cool book. I struggled through it when I first got it. It's quite the beast <laughs> of a book. And so uh, the program that I was working on, the food and nutrition program I was working on, a big part of it was to tackle this, like what first, what next, the, the bare minimum to get a ton out of it without drowning in it. Because <laughs> it's, it's quite the, the beast. All right, so this is showing a modern diet, a traditional diet, and a primal diet. So primal, kind of referring to back before we... Uh, developed a lot of our food cultures and got real smart about food. Um, what, what was the diet you had, you had mentioned when we met? Paleo. paleo. So primal is similar to like uh, what some people might understand to be paleo of very, very minimal preparation, processing, and very simple assortment of foods um, that you might run into if you're foraging. You know, that's, that's pretty close to how our distant ancestors were living. And then over time, we learned to prepare our food better and better to harm us less and less. And so that's where you get traditional food. And an aspect of that too is the quality. We didn't used to over farm our land. Um, we didn't used to uh, inject our animals with um, antibiotics and, and all these poisons that eventually get to us. Uh, and so with here in the plant protein, you see tofu, temp, uh, natto, and you, there's a little asterisk that says traditionally fermented. Uh, soybeans can be very damaging to the body, and traditionally they were always fermented to make them less damaging. Uh, in modern industrial foods, uh, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> like it takes a lot of time and space and uh, extra money to properly produce food in the traditional you know, best way that we did over time. So. So you get fake tofu that's industrial light, industrially processed. Um, let's see, here we've got, so we've got poultry, eggs, beef, pork, fish, seafood, dairy, game, um, entire animal including organs, bones, connective tissues, etc. Over here, mostly mean muscle cuts. That's practically all we eat, so we don't eat the whole animal anymore. We don't do organ meats hardly at all anymore. Um, so over processing, lower quality, the soil uh, nutrition isn't there as much. Uh, so traditional, that, that's a lot of where you get organic is, is trying to make the animals and the plants better, quality the way that they would occur more in nature. But one issue with that is the better you produce plants, the better their defenses are. So if you don't know how to prepare it well, yes it has more nutrition, but also has more to hurt you. Um, so an example would be cabbage has neurotoxins. It's part of why it's bitter. That's part of why we can taste bitter is to warn us about toxins. That doesn't mean everything that's bitter is toxic, but there's often something that can harm you when you taste bitter. Uh, and so that's why cabbage needs to be steamed or cooked or fermented like traditional sauerkraut. The sauerkraut you mostly find in the store is now pickled in vinegar instead of fermented, so it's not going to do nearly as good of a job disarming that cabbage um, let's see here so yeah so along the same lines industrial processed uh, uh, plants like cabbage instead of the traditional methods all right so this is a cool book this is the fourfold path to healing working with the laws of nutrition therapeutics meaning uh, supplements uh, movement and meditation in the art of medicine and it's the first uh, four chapters are separately talking about those four categories and then breaking it down um, by kind of ailments so whatever ails you so there's there's heart disease there's diabetes there's chronic fatigue and kind of uh, focusing each of these things to do the most good for that so just like cure tooth decay is the same stuff, the same foods, um, but picking specifically the ones that are best for 
having the right ratio of calcium and magnesium in your blood so that you're not pulling from your nutrient reserves like your teeth and your bones to make cavities and brittle bone syndrome and that sort of thing. Um, really, really cool. Sorry if I lost you. Oh, no. You're um, So that, and then in the, in the, at the end of each chapter of the ailments, it's got a summary of nutrition, avoid all vegetable oils, which will be almost in every like, chapter, the seed oils, uh, emphasize supplements, therapeutics, movement, meditation. Uh, so really excellent resource. This is a huge, huge, huge part of this whole thing. So around the 18, 1880s, um, Procter and Gamble were working with cotton seeds and cotton and had a byproduct that they needed to do something with, cotton seed oil. And uh, at first they didn't know what to do. And then they started to incorporate it into animal feed and then later into human feed. And this is where our health started to take a massive downturn was when they started taking this this byproduct, this toxic byproduct, and working it into processed foods. And uh, so, so these are our traditional good, good fats and oils. So fats and oils, they're, they're lipids, so we just refer to them as lipids. Um, the difference is fats are normally solid at room temperature, oils are normally liquid at room temperature. There are some, uh, some exceptions, but generally that's how it is. So these were, these were all, always around pretty much, like for, for a very, very long time. Olive oil, avocado oil, peanut oil, butter, ghee, tallow, lard, so the fat from uh, cows and pigs, uh, cocoa butter, uh, macadamia nut oil, coconut oil, uh, almond oil. These are all purpose, so they can, they can all take a, a fairly high amount of heat, some more than others, and then the ones that are cautioned with heat, walnut oil, flax oil, sesame, walnuts, uh, any seed oil is very, you really need to be careful with heat, uh, uh, fish fat, and grapeseed oils. So these have been around a long time, and nature doesn't make bad oils, humans do. And so these over here, these are man-made. These, as soon as you extract these seed oils with heat and pressure, they're instantly oxidized, they're instantly rancid, they're instantly bad for you. Um, so soy oil, uh, sunflower, safflower, canola, corn, cottonseed, hydrogenated oils. Uh, fun fact about canola oil, there is no canola plant. Canola stands for Canadian oil low acid. And what it is, is rapeseed oil, which has, I believe it's called, I believe it's uric acid. I confuse some of the uric and there's a similar thing. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uric acid is known to cause heart disease. And so they found a way to lower the amount of uric acid some, so it causes heart disease slower. <laughs> and, they, and, they, and they renamed it Canadian oil low acid canola oil. So that's fun. <laughs> so let's see here. Uh, so in nursing, in deep nutrition, over and over and over again, they hammer in number one, avoid commercial seed oils or vegetable oils, however you want to label them. All of these things, uh oh. Time to dance. Sorry, one sec. So we use um, like avocado oil mm -hmm. a lot. And mm -hmm. what else would you say? Coconut oil, olive oil, sesame. So those, those are categorized as like good oils to use Free. daily? Yes, um, with a caveat. With a caveat. So you see right here, limited use, we have refined peanut oil, refined avocado oil, refined coconut oil. So if you over-process just about anything, um, it can become kind of bad. It can, it can get worse. So uh, if you have an avocado oil that isn't boasting about how it's expeller pressed or done through good methods or you know the uh, avocados are done with uh, good stewardship of the soil to get good nutrition in there it might not be the best uh, it's typically though much safer and better than these uh, 
part of the reason is avocado oil is monounsaturated. So it is more difficult for it to go bad. It's more difficult for it to oxidize because there's only one space open for oxygen to slip in. These are polyunsaturated, which means uh, even if you don't heat them, if you extract the oils and you, have, you expose them to oxygen, then over time, they'll, they'll oxidize. Over time, they'll go bad. That's why you keep them in the fridge mostly. So if you buy flaxseed oil, you'll almost always find it in the fridge because even just room temperature, over time, it will oxidize. It will go bad because it's polyunsaturated. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means um, on a molecular level. Excellent question. More, more questions? I'm going awful fast. Um, feel free to throw them out. So humans make bad oils. They're bleached, deodorized, refined, hydrogenated. I found I, it can be quite difficult finding lard these days. I went looking for lard at a butcher shop, and they had a box of it. Oh boy, lard. And I look a little closer on the box, and it says hydrogenated lard to make it last even longer. Lard lasts a real long time. And I think one of, the, one of the reasons, I think it was also deodorized, is they don't want it to start to have an odor at all. They don't want it to go bad, so they make it bad ahead of time. Uh, same with vegetable oil. So vegetable oil, vegetable oil never goes bad because it's already bad. It's already oxidized, it's already processed. Um, it's already terrible. Okay, so. Does anyone, this is probably the, potentially the most important slide, especially when it comes to application. Would anyone like to like snap a photo of this before I go on? Yeah. Go for it. So if we see like an expeller press, that's like a good hot button thing to look out for. It's, like done it's typically a good, good sign. Way. Yeah, it typically means, you know, whatever it is has been squozen to get the oil out rather than adding also heat and pressure to get every last little drop. Um, so the oil or fat is typically much better preserved uh, and, and hasn't, gone, has, hasn't gotten oxidized. Okay, let's see here. So this is, this is one, of, one common production process for making a seed oil. So you've got you got a mixer holding tank, chilled water, mixer crystal, crystallizer, hot water. You got pressure and heat, uh, wax, separator sludge, uh, steam, hot water. There are worse ones. There's, uh, let's see, de-waxing, neutralizing. There's bleaching oftentimes, uh, all kinds of nasty processes. And by, by the time you get here, it's, it's not a natural product anymore. It's, it's industrial waste. It's just awful. Here's, here's more, so then you get the bleaching, deodorizing, vacuuming, uh, filtering, degumming. It's just terrible in the finished oil. Conversely, here's the process for making butter. So you've got uh, separating out the cream. For the most part, you'll have some milk, still particles with the, with the cream. You'll churn it or, or whip it or beat it, and you'll make those fat molecules stick together and clump together and become more solid, and the milk can drain out, filter out, add a little salt, and that's butter. A lot less processing, a lot less uh, nastiness, plus uh, cream can take a lot more heat and pressure than polyunsaturated seed oils. So, so this is an example of a great lipid as long as you're using high quality uh, milk and cream. So how to enjoy vegetable oil. Step one, choose heart healthy vegetable oils like canola, safflower, soybean, etc. Step two, place directly in the garbage can. <laughs> Step three, aggressively purchase butter, ghee, beef tallow, coconut oil, high quality olive oil. Um, I just think that's kind of fun. And uh, yeah. Okay, so saturated fat and unsaturated fat. A lot of people believe saturated fat will gum up your arteries and give you heart attacks. Really not that way. It's not how it works. Uh, what it means for it to be saturated and unsaturated is this is a carbon chain. So lipids have carbon chains and they have hydrogen attached uh, at, at each port where there's an, an electron bind to. 
unsaturated, it'll have it'll have gaps. It'll have places where it's either you know it's unbonded or there's a double bond between carbons, and this is fairly easy typically to to break, and for something else to come and bond like oxygen. So oxygen will bond in there in this gap, and it'll get a free ride into the body, and then it'll break off, and it'll be unhappy. It'll be imbalanced, unstable, and it'll need uh, another electron to make it happen. So it'll go around and it will steal from another bond, uh, from, from another molecule, and break it apart. And those two will be unhappy. And they'll do the same thing. And they'll break. They'll take another electron. It'll be like a zombie apocalypse of, of free radicals. This is what a free radical is. And it does tissue damage. It will, will literally break down your tissues and do damage as these molecules are trying to become balanced. And so what saves you from that is antioxidants because they have a whole bunch of extra uh, electrons. They're like, you have an electron, you have an electron, everyone gets electrons. And that stops that free radical damage from happening. So you've got a stable molecule, you've got a free radical, oxygen, t uh, getting a free ride on that lipid, taking an electron, and then they break apart, zombie apocalypse, and it is no bueno. And then enough of that, that's, ox that's oxidative stress. So oxygen, oxidative stress, uh, pulling and taking and breaking down the cells. So normal cell, free radicals attacking the cell, and the cell can eventually die from a, a oxidative stress from this happening. And you know, seed oils are in practically everything. Like if you're not being careful, it's everywhere. It's, uh, it's the oil that your french fries are fried in if you go out to a restaurant. Now you can make great french fries at home, cooking your french fries in butter, duck fat, lard, coconut oil, um, that's excellent. But restaurants don't want to pay that higher price, so you're going to get low quality seed oils. And it's just a massive storm of oxidative stress every time you get french fries out of the restaurant. So if you're going to go around with burger, skip the fries. That's the best part. I know, that's what I was They're delicious, aren't they? That's my favorite. It's unfortunate. And that's, and that's because we're wired to love fats and oils. We're wired to go for lipids. They're just the best thing in life. But man-made ones are going to mess you up. So you want natural ones. Whether it's from plants, whether it's from animals, uh, as long as it's made the right way. It's not over processed. It's not hydrogenated. Um, it's not a fake oil, then it's okay. So you got an antioxidant. It's got a whole bunch of extra electrons, and it's just giving them out. This is a free radical, and now it's happy and balanced. It's got the right amount of electrons in its valence shell, if you remember your chemistry, and it's going to stop doing damage. Uh, so back to, back to the arteries getting clogged. That happens more from bad oils and potentially sugar can make it worse, and it creates little ruptures in your veins from oxidative stress, from your tissues breaking down. And so you get kind of cuts and leaking in your veins that your body will send cholesterol to, to patch it. Cholesterol is a great patcher. Cholesterol is awesome, we want cholesterol. Our cells are made of cholesterol. A, a, a big portion of them is what's made with cholesterol. And so you do patching, and then you eat more french fries, and then you do more tears, and then you do more patching. And eventually those patches add up and add up, and eventually clog. And so then, you know, someone, someone dies of a heart attack, the, the um, what, coroner, whoever goes in and chops you up and sees what happened, goes into your veins like, oh, there's a whole big old thing of uh, cholesterol, that's what did it. So, so the cops come, oh, it's cholesterol. They're at the scene of the crime trying to fix the problem when the real, the real culprit is oxidative stress through vegetable oils, through sugar. That's what I'm saying. So you're saying the oxidative stress is what causes the tear or the, yeah. the need for it to catch? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So we know the food pyramid. Here's the fat pyramid. Fat is our friend. Lipids are our friend. So conversely to what politically correct nutrition tells you, you want the most saturated fat. So the more saturated, the more thick, uh, the more you want of it. So things like coconut oil, butter, animal fats from beef, lamb, um, you know, cream, butter fat, all that stuff. And then monounsaturated, you don't need as much of. So olive oil, peanut oil, uh, lard. And, and, and most fats and oils are a mixture of saturated 
the monounsaturated, polyunsaturated. Uh, but depending on which one they have like the most of, that's what you'll categorize them as. Um, and then you need the least of polyunsaturated. These are the very susceptible to heat um, and going rancid. And so things like cod liver oil, flax oil, evening primrose, and these will typically be kept in the refrigerated section in your health food stores, again, because they're very easy to go bad. Uh, still important in the diet, but you don't need as much. And certainly, you don't need any of the polyunsaturated ones that have been screwed up and overprocessed. All right, so sugar is bad too. So again, so the number one is avoid vegetable oils. Number two is avoid high amounts of sugar of any kind. Um, the main reason sugar is bad is glycation. Glycation is the stickiness of sugar. Um, how's it going? Uh, the stickiness of sugar when you notice like uh, fruit juice dry on the table and it's sticky. On a molecular level, it's also sticky and it'll fuse with uh, proteins or, uh, or fat molecules in the body. It'll fuse together and the more sugar you take in, the more fusing, and the harder it is for antioxidants to come and break it apart, or you know, um, harder it is for them to get taken care of. And the longer they stay that way, the, uh, the, the more solid that bond becomes, and the harder it is to break it apart. That's one of the most, uh, one of the biggest reasons why sugar is bad. And then that does a lot of other things too. You get blood sugar spikes, and, and it messes with your insulin. You, get, you know, your insulin producers get screwed up. And you can't deal with it as easily. Uh, so sugar is bad too. But I would make the case, as do all of these, that vegetable oil is much, much worse. And no one talks about it, almost. Like very few talk about it. Uh, we talked about on it. Uh, he gets uh, supplements from this really great company by Aubrey Marcus, if you're familiar with Aubrey Marcus, who has another really great book that talks about the same stuff, a portion of it, but then all, all the other health aspects, too. It's really great. It's called Own the Day, Own Your Life. Highly recommend it. And Let's see, why did I talk about that? I was going into, oh, oh, no one talks about it, except for Aubrey Marcus talks about it, um, Kate Shanahan, uh, Sally Fallon, but very, very few, and certainly, typically, not your medical doctor, unfortunately. Uh, so their training, their training is internal medicine and surgery. Right. They have one class of Right, and we could, we could go into why that is. There's a bunch of interesting reasons why that is. But the average doctor, if they're lucky, they've got, they took one nutrition class in their, in their, during their education. So many of them don't even know, which is a shame. And they don't know that they don't know. And, and a lot of them don't know that they don't know. <laughs> exactly. And even if they did know, they can't, they can't monetize it typically. And then they might be nice. Anyway, we won't go too far into that. But... Uh, but it's sad, no, no one's talking about vegetable oil. So sugar, so carbohydrates, breads, um, pastas, things like that, a carbohydrate is a chain of sugar. So you've got sugar here, and you've got a chain of sugar that are carbohydrates. Sure, they break down slower, so they don't overwhelm the system quite as fast, but they're still sugar, they're still not great. And what, uh, what a lot of these you know, books will tell you is, you know, uh, great way to think about food if you're thinking about macronutrients which is one small part of nutrition but an important part is with lipids with fats and oils there's no upper limit and sure if your body's not used to it you might need to kind of ease into doing high amounts of fats and oils and there's you know all there's there's uh, a lot we can talk about of, of going into that, that would be called ketogenics you know how to get your body used to ketogenics but generally your body does quite well up to a point and then give yourself a little time to do more. So no upper limit for fats and oils, no lower limit for carbohydrates and sugar, which again are basically the same thing, uh, and you want to be fairly low. And then protein is, is like the Goldilocks. It needs to be just right. It needs to be within a certain um, amount. So between, between, I think, 12 and 20% of your caloric intake should be protein depending on how, how active you are. Uh, but because, because fats and oils get such a bad rap, because it's high calories, you know, uh, they get such a bad rap, and then sugar and carbohydrates also get a bad rap, but um, it's true. <laughs> uh, everyone's like, let's just do tons of protein. It's really hard on the body. You want a manageable amount that your body can deal with, otherwise it's tough on the liver and, and various 
uh, systems in the body. So sugar and carbohydrates, you want to take it down? Okay, this is fun. Um, who's heard of epigenetics? Just out of curiosity. Epigenetics. Okay, so we have a few. So we have our genes that are fairly set of how they're written. And then we have epigenetics, which is the expression of our genes. And that is not set in stone at all. That can fluctuate like crazy. And especially over generations, uh, it can change a ton. And it can, if I understand right, it can lead to permanent changes in DNA, or alter DNA going down the line. You can get defects in, in DNA, especially over generations. So anyway, so epigenetics is the ex expressing of your genes based on your environment, including sunlight, nutrition, uh, thoughts. Like, the body's an incredible machine, and everything you're doing, the stress, the thoughts, the food, can alter how your genes manifest. Uh, and, and effectively switches on and off different genes. So you, so you have a ton of genetic information that isn't used in your body. And we have blueprints for all kinds of things, like tails, that we don't use. We have that blueprint. We have lots of different blueprints that we don't use and we don't want to use. And our body, given the right nutrition, will, uh, in general, give us the right, like uh, an optimal manifestation of our genes. If, yeah, if if, uh, if it's not screwed with with fake fake ingredients like vegetable oils. So you're saying you don't want a tail? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am a climber, so actually. <laughs> For balance and an extra extra reach, that might be kind of cool. <laughs> Although when I'm dating, I'm not so sure it would be a positive characteristic to have. So all in all, probably no, but it would be kind of cool. Um, yeah, yeah, Def uh, free ride into the circus for sure. Yeah. Um, food is information. So food is talking to your genes about how you should manifest your genes. Uh, one, great, one great example is pigment. Pigment can have a lot to do with nutrition, um, both telling your genes what to do and giving them the building blocks for doing the right thing with pigment. Um, when nutrition isn't quite right, it's much harder to tan. Uh, and some people it's harder for tan, to tan anyway but you'll get burnt more, and then the burn will just go away after a while, and you won't, you won't tan, more likely if you're not getting adequate levels of vitamin A and D, which are sun nutrients. Uh, yeah, so food is information. We won't go into that, but that's a fun one too. All right, this is cute, so you got a blind pig here. Uh, there was an experiment where they took pigs, and they restricted their diet to have zero vitamin A. Vitamin A in the diet is an indicator of sunlight. And so with no vitamin A in the diet, oh, oh, and then they had the pig, they got the pigs pregnant, and then the pigs gave birth to a litter. Any guesses for what happened to the pigs? The, the, the pigs. They're blind, okay, anyone else? And they probably had birth defects too. Birth of death leaves, birth defect. Uh, any other, anything They else? weren't tanned. They, they weren't tan. Very good. <laughs> Anything else? Were they white? <laughs> okay, this might blow your mind a little. They had no eyes. No eyes at all? They had no wow. eyes. Okay, that's... Well, they are blind. They are blind. You're not wrong. They're blind. But, but they didn't even have eyes. They had, they had eye cavities. They had eye lids. But there were no eyes. Creepy. It's creepy. And your eyes are like part of your brain. So that's a part of your brain that doesn't develop if you don't have vitamin A. Yeah, bummer, huh? It's like the only part of your brain that's outside your skull. Yeah, <laughs> super bummer. Wow, um, that's crazy. But on the other hand, if there really was no life, why waste all that nutrition and development on creating eyes? Yeah. Um, you could use that for so many better things uh, than eyes if you're not going to use your eyes, right? So it's kind of cool. It's kind of smart. There are... Uh, there are underground salamanders that are the same. They have no eyes, but they have eyelids. They have the blueprints for eyes in their genes, but they don't need them. 
because they're underground, there's no sunlight, and, and so instead of using those nutrients and, and that, and that develop, development power uh, to make eyes, instead they have like, kind of like sonar, like they have, they can see in the dark somewhat, they can maybe heighten sense of smell, heighten sense of hearing, so they can find the bugs that they need to eat, and that way. which is so cool, because um, like it just goes to show you how intelligent uh, life forms are, just beyond, beyond comprehension. Uh, they take in the, inf the information through their skin, through their mouth, uh, and they change how they manifest. Really, really cool. Um, oh, and then they took that litter of blind pigs, they fed them a more regular diet, more whole diet with vitamin A, and the next litter had eyes. So you're turning on and off. So and these pigs wow. that have no eyes, they live. They did. Well, yeah, it's, it was in like a scientific study. So, I mean, they could, they could still be fed by the, okay. you know, so by the scientists. Okay. They were okay, yeah. If they were left out to their own. <laughs> I just didn't know if they, like, didn't function or whatever, if they had more defects than just the eyes. Most likely, if they're just released into the wild, they probably wouldn't make it. Yeah. Uh, something would eat it. Something would eat it. <laughs> they wouldn't see it coming. Um, right. But if they were underground and there was no light, they'd be on a more equal playing field. So, interesting stuff. All right, here's another kind of similar study. And this answers a lot of questions people have about why some people get sick and why some people don't uh, when they're having kind of the same kind of lifestyle. And that's sort of thing. So this one, this is Pottinger's Kitten. Some of you may have heard of it. But Pottinger's Pot kitchen, Kittens, they took uh, a bunch of cats, and they, it, it's a bit more complicated than this, but put simply, they had one set of cats having raw milk and raw meat. Uh, so a diet, they'd, they'd um, be having, it's more similar to out in nature. So when they're nursing, they'd have milk, and they're, you know, they're going to track down mice and have raw meat, right? Um, the, other, the other group of cats were fed cooked meat, cooked milk, and they had, they had other things in their diet, but generally speaking, um, those are the main differences, like live food, with live enzymes, and that sort of thing, uh, as opposed to cooked meat. So, and this was going to be a very, very long study, and it was a very long study over generations of cats to see how they do. And what they saw was uh, the, the first batch of litter, uh, the first litter of cats uh, from the raw milk, raw meat one, like no problem. They're doing great. They're healthy. They're strong. They're fast. They have they have good reflexes. Already, the the next generation of kids on cooked meat, cooked uh, milk, they're slower. They have less energy. They're a little more awkward when they're thrown up in the air. They don't quite land quite right. It's kind of sad, and, you know. <laughs> um, there's there's lots of really unfortunate studies, but they teach us a lot. Um, let's see here. Oh, and there's, there's YouTube of this. You can type in Pottinger's cat, and there's like a really old, with the actual footage, there's an old video. It's not too long, and it goes over this whole thing in detail, and it shows the cats, and it shows them moving, and tossed lightly up in the air, and which ones land, which ones don't. They're tested in many ways. I think social skills, too, were tested as well. Those degenerate. So each generation, the cats just got worse and worse. Uh, they'd start having, uh, they'd be more deformed. Their teeth wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't um, come in as well. They'd have softer gums. Their teeth would be more floating than their gums. Uh, worse and worse. And then by the fourth generation, they were, they were either born still, like stillborn, or they couldn't produce more cats. So it, it ended there on that side. So four generations, no more cats on that side. Uh, however, partway through this, maybe two or three generations in, they took some of the cats and moved them over to the other study, and they showed that over time they could be rehabilitated. Um, those cats, maybe never quite to 100% if they had had adequate nutrition through gestation and formative years, uh, but their, their um, future generations, basically 100%, quite, quite near to. So you can, you can turn those genes back, those good genes back on, you can nourish those genes back to health, it takes time. Uh, but then the, uh, the group of cats that were fed a more natural diet, raw, um, 10 generations, no problem. And in the study, 
we, we, we found something. So food more, more closely related to the traditional diet of a cat does better than processed cat food. Uh, let's see here. And so when you think about someone who's smoked their whole life and maybe eat so-so, and yet they live to be 90, and quite good health most of the time. Yet they're smoking tobacco, maybe they're, you know, they're doing drugs, whatever, and they do much better. Now you take someone who's, whose past generations have had a much poorer diet, and then you do the same thing, and then you do you know, smoking and, and, and toxic things to the diet, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna respond as well, they're not gonna do as well, and so that's, that's referred to as genetic endurance. So the sicker your genes are, the less good of a start you have, the more a bad lifestyle affects you. Um, and that can create a lot of confusion. So you can have someone who, who maybe the, the generation before, they did quite well, and they're born, they have a few health problems, and then they become the green smoothie girl, and they only do like ground up, you know, raw plants, and they're like, I have so much energy, and it fixed those problems I was having. Well, that's not over lots of generations. That's a single, gener like part of one generation and she had a good enough start that she can do things that maybe aren't best. And there's a lot of natural, um, natural toxins in the diet that she can take for a long time. If you take over many generations, you're gonna see not as good results. So, let's see here. Any questions? Okay, so one aspect of a healthy diet is variety. Different foods have different, uh, different ratios of nutrients, different nutrients all together, so you want a varied diet. You want to eat a lot of different things, uh, including different parts of the animal, because what you get in muscle meat is different from what you get in the liver, in uh, kidneys, heart, all that kind of thing. Things that we used to eat, even in America, not that long ago, pretty commonly. Uh, and that they still eat in many other countries very regularly. You get different things. You want variety in the diet, different colors, um, strange foods, all of that. You want quality made ingredients. Animals that are eating their traditional diet. So cows that are eating grass and hay rather than genetically modified corn and soy and nasty stuff like that. Uh, and hopefully raised on pasture instead of sledging around in their own feces and mud and, and then skin with that still on them and get some meat. And then you need to cut your meat when that's your meat because you're gonna get your coli. But if they're clean and they're on pasture, maybe they get washed before they're, they're, they're cut open and they're treated well, they're, you know, they have a good life and they don't have their, uh, what's that? Happy cows. Happy cows and they don't suffer through old age, um, you know, and they're not pumped full of nasty stuff. Uh, plants, if you don't have good nutrient, uh, nu nu nutrients in the soil, if the soil isn't turned and, and added to things decomposed in the soil, then you're not gonna get as rich of a nutrient profile in the, in the vegetables. So when you, when you look at the nutrient profile of the plant, that's like some average or some plant long ago or whatever, that's not accurate to what you're eating. It's always different, it's always a little bit different. And so organic is supposed to mean more, mimic, more mimicking nature, more mim mimicking what that plant's supposed to get, rather than relying on phosphorus and chemical fertilizers to create the shape devoid of great nutrition, right? Um, great, so high quality. Especially with animal products. So animals, uh, have what's called bioaccumulation. So they eat things and they store the nutrients in them. They also store toxins in them. So the bad, poor quality animals are a big buildup of poor quality uh, feed and toxins in their environment. Mm -hmm. uh, conversely, if they're eating good stuff, then there are a huge buildup of vitamin A, vitamin D, some nutrients in their fat, um, good stuff. Uh, antioxidants, all kinds of stuff. So wanting quality, and if you don't have a limitless budget, which many of us don't, uh, you want to make sure that your animal products are 
quality plants are a little bit less important. Okay, Paul. Paul, oh, good. Where, you do that? Where do you get your meat? Great question. Um, a few different places. I typically get my, my meat from Good Earth. Good Earth uh, is on Riverdale. Yeah. And then Natural Grocers can also be a great choice. Uh, I, I tend to look for grass fed, organic is nice if they can. Local farmers, uh, at the farmer's market, there's a farm that's near where I grew up in Malad and Idaho, and they come all the way out here and sell their meat at the farmer's market. It's Maddox Farms, and I'll have a lot of this later. Yeah, they're great. And they even sell, they, they sell liver, they sell ground heart, they sell... Oxtail. Uh, do they sell oxtail? Yeah, they sell basically all parts of the animal. It's really cool. Um, I'm not sure about Rocky Mountain oysters. I'll have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so any of those places. One of my favorite products is at uh, Natural Grocers, and it's raw ground bison meat with liver and heart ground into it. That's I'll look for that because that's where we've been getting our. Um, cool. It's in the freezer section. Um, they have other things beside. They have the beef too. Beef bites and there's something else. There's another one, but they have all of that. Yeah, I think elk or, or elk is yeah, yeah, something. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll usually get one of those places. Uh, it doesn't have to be certified organic, but you want quality, you want you want it as well. All right. What was I gonna say about this? We're gonna skip that. All right, now another big part of another big part of uh, eating healthy is preparing your seeds. So seeds, including grains, nuts, all these things, these have one of the highest uh, concentrations of anti-nutrients. And it was one of my biggest problems why I was getting so many cavities was whole wheat bread. Um, Lots of phytic acid, uh, enzyme inhibitors, uh, gluten, you know, all these things that can really be harsh on the body. And so you want to either sprout, so, so soak, or dip. so soak, and probably sprout, and maybe ferment. Perhaps it's an or ferment, like one of those things to help prepare. So let's, uh, let's see what's next. Let me go back. So let's talk about wheat. Wheat has enzyme inhibitors to keep the seed from germinating too soon before conditions are right. So uh, that stops the enzymes from creating, uh, doing its uh, chemical reactions and growing and, and becoming a plant. Uh, and so when a seed is soaked, those en enzyme inhibitors slough off. But if we don't soak it, those enzyme inhibitors will fight our natural enzyme in our stomach that help us digest and we'll get a lot of uh, resistance in our digestion from those seeds. So that's, that's one reason why to soak it. And then you have phytic acid, which is storage form phosphorus. And so it's a very complex nutrient. It's missing certain things. And if you ingest it before that's prepared, before that comes whole, it'll try to take it from your body, try to take it from the other food that you eat, take it from your digestive system. And by the time it's whole, Sometimes it's so far through your digestive system you can't use it anymore. And it makes great fertilizer, ph uh, phosphorus, you know, fertilizer when you're out the other end. Um, but better is to help that phosphorus become whole and usable before you ingest it. And then you have gluten, which is storage form, is a, a storage form uh, protein, which has lots of great stuff. It could become wonderful if you, again, say you sprout the wheat, let it grow, let it get a stem. That gluten will naturally go away. It'll, it'll be transformed into useful nutrition. And so, sprouted bread, getting the benefits of what I just uh, described, of, of preparing, uh, getting rid of some of those anti nutrients and trans transforming other ones. And then, fermentation can do a lot of the same stuff in a different way. So, fermentation, so grinding the, the wheat, mixing it with water and a culture, and letting the beneficial bacteria break down the gluten, transforming other things, help the phosphorus become whole, 
and then you get traditional bread, which is sourdough, or sprouted, or a mixture of those things. Modern bread is not, not how we used to do it. It's uh, very, very detrimental. And that's why you get so many people with gluten intolerance and celiac disease. We're not used to just grinding bread and, and heating it. When you think about old fashioned, like stone, stone grinding, uh, Rocks and stuff that, that more ancient people used to use, or even or even grain mills where you have a you have like a donkey like go around and grind the wheat. Those most of those things didn't take dry kernels and grind them. If you've ever tried to take like try to grind them in like mortar and pestle, pestle or one of those big rocks, they just shoot out. <laughs> they don't really grind. Uh, with the big rock, that they would soak the kernels and then they'd mush them. They wouldn't grind them. So again, so we're not used to it, very detrimental, so we want to properly prepare grains. Another example is oatmeal. Oatmeal was traditionally soaked in water and yogurt or something to culture the oatmeal. So when I, when I make oatmeal, I soak it with water and yogurt the night before, let it culture, ferment overnight. It gets a nice sour taste. And then I cook it, uh, and then I ha add butter, uh, syrup and sweetener, and it's fantastic. So it's it's savory from the butter, it's sweet from like the maple syrup, and it's kind of tart and sour from the fermentation. And that does a lot of preparing uh, of that grain to be less detrimental. So are we talking like any kind of oatmeal, or what kind of oatmeal are we talking? Um, yeah, from just, oats. Just rolled oats? Rolled oats, okay. right. And, and just about any, even if you're doing, you know, cracked wheat could still benefit from this process. Um, what else is there? There's, a, there's another really common one. Basically, any grain, you want to at least soak it, probably cook it at some point, maybe sprout it, maybe ferment it, but just taking it in its like regular form um, and, and only cooking it, you're typically getting a lot of anti-nutrients. They're going to fight your body. They're going to leach nutrients out of you. They're going to fight your digestion, and they're going to be real part of your body. Right. It's not processed. It's really not good for you. Right. Um, and, as, and as far as like good for you or not good for you, it's all a spectrum. Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, if it's beans that are just like quick cooked, right. they're not. It's, it's got a lot of stuff back. They're not nearly as good for you as they could be. Uh, if they were soaked for a long time, uh, maybe sprouted a little bit, and then cooked, they're going to be much better. So, uh, so like oatmeal, it's going to have some good nutrition. But you don't want that phytic acid to steal some of that nutrition. So, so everything's on, the, on a spectrum. It's got X amount of anti-nutrients. It's got X amount of these different nutrients. And uh, that's another reason why you want to vary your diet. You can't always take all anti-nutrients out of your diet. And different foods have different ratios of nutrients. So the more you eat different things, the better off you can be. Um, a lot of cow, sorry, a lot of uh, animals that graze like cows. They'll eat some of one plant and they'll get kind of toxic in some of the defense mechanisms of plants, a lot of anti-nutrients. Um, and then they'll go eat a different plant and that a lot of times have nutrients that help detox the cow of those other anti-nutrients. We as humans have developed the ability to prepare our food so that we can be more healthy, um, get harmed by our food less, but we've forgotten a lot of those things over time. We've forgotten how to do that. So, I've forgotten to <laughs> um, Yeah, so legumes are also a type of seed. Basically all seeds, they're, they're, they're storage for them. They're, they're protecting themselves, and they need to be unpacked somehow. All right, so the four pillars of world cuisine. Uh, featuring the four pillars of the human diet or world cuisine. So these are the four, four sets of strategies that all traditional cultures have in common. Uh, virtually all, or you know, something, some things that are similar. So meat cooked on the bone. Typically in the US these days, we cut meat off of the bone. The bones are gross. We don't want to have to spit stuff out on our plate like they do in many other places. Uh, but we still do it some. So think rotisserie chicken, think chicken wings, um, you know, T-bone steak things like that. Uh, the reason we want meat on the bone is bones are a huge nutrient store. 
We store lots of good things in our bones. And when we cook meat on the bone or have bones in our soup, have bone in soup, we're getting a lot of those nutrients to, to unpack and come off uh, the bones and the joints. The joints have amazing nutrients for our joints. Um, and, then, and then also bone marrow is also an amazing nutrient store that uh, we used to utilize so much more. We used to make bone stock out of it. We used to scoop the marrow out, have to cook it, and put it on sourdough toast uh, and crackers. We don't do that as much anymore. Um, mm. and, and getting eating bones. Eating bones. My friends in Africa, they're like, oh, we eat the whole chicken. Absolutely. Um, so I, like I said before, I spent quite a bit of time in China, and a lot of their recipes, um, they're fairly long cooking techniques, and the bones will get fairly soft. And usually you can at least eat some of it, but you like gnaw and chew off some of it, especially the joints. But depending on how they cooked it, sometimes you can eat the whole bone. And uh, depending on how good your teeth are, you can eat more and more. And so I had a roommate who was like native, native, like out of the boonies, Chinese, and he had amazing teeth. Like naturally straight, beautiful white, strong, and we we make meals together and we cook them up. And I would as much as I could eat the bone, but it was only a little bit of it. He would take these hard, hard, hard bones and he would break them apart with his teeth. It was unbelievable. And then the more you do that, the stronger your teeth get, and the more you can eat the bones. So it's a opposite of a vicious cycle. It's an awesome cycle. <laughs> uh, great. So bone broth. Me cooked on the bone, getting excellent nutrition out of there, calcium, magnesium, uh, from the joints, glycosaminoglycans. So the stuff that you find in joint uh, supplements, you're getting a wider array of that family of nutrients, and they haven't been dried and overheated and processed where they break down and degrade. You're, when you gnaw on the joint of an animal, you're getting a way better joint supplement than you are out of the bottle. All right, so uh, number two, soaking, sprouting, and fermenting. We went over this briefly, and some, some examples are sauerkraut, sourdough bread. We'll go into these a little bit more in a second. Um, but sauerkraut, so shredding up cabbage, pounding it, adding uh, water, salt, and uh, like whey. So if you strain yogurt, you get a clear kind of glowing liquid out of it. That's a great culture to use to ferment um, vegetables. There aren't milk solids, so it's not going to go... Uh, milk, milk rancid or whatever. Uh, or you can just add extra salt and the naturally occurring bacteria will help you ferment that thing. Uh, sourdough bread. Okay, number three, organ meats and the nasty bits. So the various parts of the animal. Um, not that long. So there's uh, The Joy of Cooking is a very famous cookbook that's had many editions over time. To go back, I want to say it's like 1940 something edition. They've got all kinds of recipes for liver, and kidney, and tongue, and that used to be really common here. And then we just start moving away from it and getting sicker and sicker from all of these things, but that too. Um, one of my favorite dishes in uh, China was brains. So it's slowly boiled in a spicy, spicy liquid uh, with all kinds of seasonings. It's delicious. Uh, from, uh, from what they typically do it from pigs, okay. um, but they, they do it from Monkeys, I hear, not very common, but they do. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of like the famous gross one that people often. Yeah, it's Indiana Jones, right? That's the monkey brains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that's where it Yeah. I remember that scene vividly. I remember when they cut the snake and all the baby snakes come out. Yeah, it was all yeah. Yeah. It was scary. It was a bad scene. <laughs> it was a bad scene. That was really scary. Um, and then probably my most favorite was lamb kidneys. Uh, barbecue lamb kidneys with tons of like the kidney fat with it. Oh, so savory and delicious. Um, and that was in Inner Mongolia. They do lamb well up there, lamb country. All right, so organ meats, nasty bits. The more, oh, uh, liver, kidney, tendon, bone marrow. The more you can cook a, the more parts of an animal you can cook, the wider array of nutrients you can get. Um, and so, again, rotisserie, chicken, or, uh, Thanksgiving dinner, the whole turkey, and a lot of times they include the organs, and most people toss it. Okay, really I found this on the web for Thanksgiving dinner, the whole, whole, whole... We used to, my mom used to cook those up, we used to eat them, yeah, during Thanksgiving. Heck we yeah. tried the heart, and the liver, and I, I love them. 
you can prepare them to be really delicious. Um, I've, I've never found turkey organs to be all that bad just, just cooking them, like with nothing, you know. You yeah. can season them to be really delicious. Sure. A little bit of salt on them and they were fine. Yeah. yeah. My mom would grind them in the mixer and put it with the rest of the gravy. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. You just never yeah. know. It was just yeah. gravy. Traditionally, I think almost always uh, sausage has organs ground into it too. Uh, or sausage, uh, yeah, yeah, sausage. Um, yeah, again, bringing back the old way of doing things that's still going in a lot of countries, and you can find it here and there in the U.S., but you really gotta look hard these days uh, or do it yourself. All right, and for this one, we do we, we do fairly well in the U.S., although not always in the smartest way. Uh, fresh, raw, plant and animal products. So, animal and plant and animal products, sometimes without cooking with the right ones, the right ways, uh, and fresh. The longer, the longer foods sit in our refrigerator or in transit, the more nutrition sluts, slut, sluts off into the air. Uh, the more nutrition grades uh, you want it as fresh as possible. You can't. Can't be perfect. We can't all have an organic uh, garden in our backyard and just dig it up and have it that moment. Although, if you've ever had corn fresh off the stock, like boiled fresh off the stock, it is worlds different. So sweet and so, and, and like not just sweet. Like there's extra, you can taste the nutrients that are still more freshly in there than like sitting in transit for so long. Uh, worlds of difference. Throw a little butter and salt in there. It's, just, it's great. So it's uh, keeping it fairly fresh. Going to the store more often rather than going once every two weeks and, and living off a massive amount just sitting in the fridge for forever, uh, going more often. In China, it was so common for the elderly to live with the family and they would often be like the cooks of the household. And almost every morning, they'd, they'd get up at the break of dawn and go to the fresh market, the farmer's market, the wet market, and get the and like barter for like the best ingredients and they're smelling it and they're like, what's come, what came in today? And most of it did. And, and then spend the day preparing it through long, slow uh, preparation techniques. And they, they nourish the family, and they eat better so their minds will stay intact much, much longer. Very uncommon to find like dementia patients, Alzheimer's, useless uh, elderly people there, much less common. Much less common. I hate to use that term, but sometimes, you know, sometimes the elderly are a burden, especially if they're not getting a, a whole diet and their minds are paying the price, especially vegetable oil. In here it talks about the seven distinct strategies vegetable uses to attack the brain. Main reason for mental problems, especially in old age, is vegetable oil. Um, great, so some examples is raw egg yolks. So the egg whites are best to have cooked. The egg yolks, most of the time, are best to have raw. You cook them sometimes, have them raw sometimes. Egg whites have Biotin inhibitors, they have, again, defenses to, to protect from overeating of eggs, right? Like the, the, the chickens don't want their, their species to go to die off. So if animals are eating too many eggs, it starts to become toxic in the animals. And they can't have humans, so we get to cook the egg whites or separate them, whatever. Uh, all right. Raw milk is another one of those. And we could, we could, we could spend a lot of time on that. So, uh, meat cooked on the bone, there's a great example, kind of a whole chicken soup type thing. Soaked oatmeal for soaked, sprouted, fermented, here's wheat, wheat berries that have been sprouted. So I do, I do have a question about your oatmeal. Yes. When you said yogurt. Yes. So, are, are we talking like a specific kind of yogurt? And like, when you soak it in water and yogurt, is it just left out on the counter? Yeah, so you're going to want to cover it so you don't get bugs in it. So cover it with, uh, I usually use like a mason jar, water, oats, yogurt, and uh, like a cheese like a cheese cloth, cheese cloth. yeah, what, whatever, to, to let let the gases and the air pass back and forth, but bugs can't. Um, and uh, there's, you know, I can share, so the recipe I haven't memorized is for every cup of oats, you do a cup of water, and then two tablespoons of yogurt, approximately. You can eyeball it. And uh, let's see. Any kind of yogurt? So, Greek yogurt? Uh, plain, full fat. We like fat. Fat is not bad. We don't want to skim milk. We want full fat. 
and quality. So coming from happy cows who are eating grass, uh, it's going to be more expensive. Hope maybe organic, um, quality yogurt uh, that, that doesn't have sugars and flavoring and that stuff. So plain. The, the added sugars can kind of like mess with it, and then the added stuff in yogurt can mess with it. So, so you look on the ingredients, and it's just yogurt. And may, maybe maybe it'll list like the bacteria that maybe they added to the poultry. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I usually get Nancy's. Nancy's is a decent price, especially at Winco. At Winco, Nancy's, organic, plain, full fat. Good too. Yeah. Winco decent. Winco holds their own, and a lot of, and they're, 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 they're having more and more brands that you normally find in health food stores, but for like way lower prices. Uh, another example is Bubby's. Bubby's does fermented sauerkraut, so traditional sauerkraut, um, fermented pickles that are to die for if you like pickles. Uh, and, and the sauerkraut and the pickles that are traditionally made are so different than like commercially vinegar, you know, ones. So if normally you don't like either of those two, Try it like the real way and, and, and mix it with other foods. Don't have it straight because it's kind of strong. Have it with other foods mixed in and you might surprise yourself if you like it. Uh, another one is, and we'll go into more of these, these brands later. Um, another one is uh, Nusa. Nusa yogurt is really great yogurt. I don't know if you'll find plain, <laughs> plain whole fat, but they're delicious. It's kind of a lot of sugar actually, but really delicious. Uh, it's like a dessert. It is like a dessert. Yeah. And, and where I was going with it is they have an ice cream. I, I took a lot of time trying to find a good ice cream. They have a really great ice cream. It's a Nusa brand at Winco. It's crazy cheap for how good it is. It's cream. I think they have egg yolks in it. Uh, they don't have a ton of the additives. It's really delicious. And then if you, if you uh, again, if you're okay to drop quite a bit of money on yogurt, my favorite is Van Luen. Ben Lewin at uh, Good Earth, it's the only place I've seen it. It is the best ice cream that's mass produced I've ever had. Really good. French, French ice cream. Did I answer all the questions? All right, here's another example of a fermented food. This is pickled salmon. Pickle is a funny term. Uh, it can mean like pickled in vinegar, so you just put vinegar and that's it. Or it can mean fermented. And in this case, it means fermented. So, and I've made this and it's delicious. And so think, think sushi, but it's spent a little bit of time with, you know, I think, so, I think there's lemon juice in it, so it's been with an acid, as well as whey. So it's, it's got something to culture it too. So it's fermented raw fish. And you throw it on a salad with some cheese and, and different vegetables, or just by itself. Oh, and there's a bunch of seasonings in there that give it a cool taste. You can have it by itself, you can have it on crackers, you can have it with uh, cream cheese and crackers, delicious. Lots of fermented foods we can talk about. All right, when wild animals uh, get a fresh kill, they typically go for the organs. Those are like the de densest uh, nutrient stores with the largest variety, maybe not including the, uh, the marrow and the bones. And they'll often chew on the bones too, but it's harder for them to get as much out of it. Um, unlike us, because we get to cook, and cooking helps a lot with that. Uh, so example of raw, you got raw yolk, fresh raw milk. How far do we want to go into this? We'll go a little bit into it. So a lot of people uh, become lactose intolerant. They can't handle lactose. And part of the reason is the way that we normally do milk these days is we cook the milk, we pasteurize it, because we got afraid that raw milk was going to make us sick. And there's a lot of reasons why that's definitely not true. Uh, we won't go real hard into the history there. but. Whenever you cook anything, you kill the enzymes. That doesn't mean you shouldn't cook everything, but it, it's, you should be aware of that. Uh, an enzyme naturally occurring in milk is lactase. And lactase breaks down lactose, which is the milk sugar. So when you cook it, you don't have any help from the milk to break down the milk sugar. So it's a lot of strain on the body, and you don't have a limitless uh, supply of enzymes in your body to help you break down food. Uh, so the more strain you put on your body, the harder. Also, when you cook milk, you make a lot of the things in the milk harder to digest. The nature of the protein, it becomes kind of shriveled and more compact and harder to digest. Uh, in in mainstream milk, they explode the fat molecules. It's called homogenation, making the whole thing the same. You don't get the 
you don't get the cream on top anymore because the fat molecules that exploded, which is terrible for your digestion, and it's all mixed together. So raw milk, usually they won't homogenize it, and you'll have the, the cream separate, so you gotta shake it. So you get a, you get a good variety of cream and, and milk solids. Uh, what else about raw milk? Also, mainstream milk, because they cook it, because they have all these processes to make it not smell like how it would smell otherwise, uh, they get to treat the cows really terribly, feed it terrible things, have terrible conditions, have them be unhappy, unhappy hormones going on in the cows. And so you can sell it for cheap, and you get low quality milk more often. Maybe it's higher quality if you get organic milk, but you still have the cooking, you still have the homogenation, you still don't have the lactase. Raw milk, they have to do a decent job of caring for their cows because otherwise there could be bad bacteria. And they have to test it for bad bacteria too. That's another reason why it's not going to make you sick. It's because they test it. Um, they have to. It's rock. So you're going to get higher quality. You're going to have a way more digestible form. Uh, and I love raw milk. Ooh, fun story. So my mom ran out of milk because she was breastfeeding me growing up. And so she bought a goat to milk so I would have fresh raw milk through my form formative years. Right? That's a mom right there. <laughs> Where do you get your raw milk? Excellent question. Uh, we'll jump to that. So um, outside of Good Earth, on Fridays, from noon to five, there is a raw milk truck that parks there. It sells raw milk, and they're, they're Redmond Heritage Farms truck. And they have raw milk, they have raw local honey, which is great for allergies, if you struggle with allergies. So are you said Friday from what? Uh, noon to five, on Fridays. And they, uh, give me just one moment. If anyone wants to get alerts about when they aren't gonna show up, uh, or any updates as far as that milk only on those days, then you can text Friday Milk, all one word, to this number. Does anyone want to do that? Does anyone want text updates? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> that's one place. Another place is Redmond's Heritage Farms. Oh, sure. That's all right. No worries. No worries. So what you text is Friday Milk, all one word, and the number is 84466. Five zero eight one nine, and they almost always show up. They the they um, had one day that they showed up the other day, and that's how I found this number. And then they'll text you like, "Hey, I won't be there that day." But, uh, they show up. They have a different day every week for, for where they show up. And so you can go to you can Google Redmond Heritage Farms and go to their raw milk page, and you can get a different text alert thing on where where you live. Uh, but they go, I think they go to like Orem, somewhere in Salt Lake, Layton, that kind of thing. Uh, you can go in store to Red Moon Heritage Farms. They have three locations. One's in Salt Lake, around, I want to say, 20th South. Um, they have a location in Orem, and they have a location in Heber, uh, Heber City. So you can go there for Rob Hill, and then. I don't think they have it at the farmer's market. Redmond or Maddox used to sell them, but their farm got damaged. Like they had flooding, and so they had to shut down there. Bummer. Um, uh, How long does um, raw, raw milk last? Great question. It, it depends, but let's say, let's say from the extraction, to, if you keep it refrigerated, uh, I'd say around, kind of a tricky question, around two weeks. Maybe a little less. It'll be gone way before that. Yeah, right? <laughs> but, but it might have set in, it might have set in store for a few days. You need to account for that. Um, but it's a tricky question because pasteurized, homogenized milk, because it doesn't have lactase to break down the lactose, and for other reasons, too, it's denatured and everything, It'll go rancid, and it'll get gross, and it'll make you sick. Uh, whereas raw milk will go sour. Raw milk will 
just get, get kind of tart because the lactase, breaking down the lactose, you get lactic acid, which is fine, which is great. In fact, a lot of people think sour milk is better for you than raw milk, and I, I tend to agree. I tend to, I try to ferment my raw milk into kefir, and uh, which is kind of like yogurt, but thinner, and it's a little different process. Uh, and that way you get less sugar, less milk sugar if you ferment it or let it sour first. So it'll sour, and then it'll separate into, I think it's still called curds and whey, if you let it separate that way. Um, and if you let it go all the way to curds and whey, in my opinion, it's usually too unpleasant to, to want to drink at that point. You can use it for other things, maybe use it for cooking and things. Uh, but it'll get, start to get real sour at that point. So. The nice thing is it won't go rancid, and even after it starts to sour, you can still drink it. So it depends on what you need. Until it starts to sour, until it starts to separate. Um, I think also people will do like sour milk or curds away like baths. Like you use it to like for skin. It's good for skin. Supposedly, I, I, I remember that from Charlotte's Web. <laughs> you can use but, sour milk for pancakes and biscuits and all kinds of things like that. Absolutely. Excellent question. Um, all right, here's another example. One of my favorites of a raw food of plant, or sorry, animal protein. So this is a dish popular around the world in different forms, and it's called steak tartare. Has anyone seen steak tartare on the menu or eaten it? You have? I've seen it. I mean, I haven't eaten it. Do you remember where you saw it? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. I've lived a lot of places. <laughs> so, so steak tartare is raw ground meat ground bicycle. Um, you want quality, you don't want the lower stuff off the Walmart shelf. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> then, then you might die. Uh, so you want you want it fresh. Uh, so it hasn't sat thawed for a really long time. You want it first frozen for at least 14 days so you kill the pathogens. I asked the Maddox guy about that. He seems to know everything about me. And he's like, he's like that's a good thing to do. Uh, we won't go too far into it. Anyway, so frozen for 14 days and high quality, and you're basically basically fully safe. Don't hold me to it. No, no. Don't, don't sue me. But, uh, <laughs> but I've eaten this so many times. I make it myself. If you get in a restaurant, you're going to pay a ton. Because they have tons of waste of this because it can only sit for so long. Uh, and it has to be high quality. And it has to be. So are we talking? So typically you're going to buy it frozen, because it needs to be frozen for days anyway. And uh, so, so that, that stuff, that ground bison meat at Good Earth, that's frozen. Uh, when you get your meat from Maddox Farms, the farmer's market, that's, I think all of what they do is frozen. Every time we've got stuff from them, it's frozen. Uh, so you're going to get it frozen, and then when you want to have it, maybe thought the day before or earlier that day, um, try not to let it sit for too long. Sorry if I hung a lot. I'm trying to fix it. It's not doing very good. Uh, and then you mix it with butter, honey, and cayenne. And there, my, the first time I saw it, the, and the recipe I made it myself was from that Cure Tooth Decay book. It's a really good one in there, especially if you get like a tooth infection. It's really great for that. I've had it so many times throughout time. And so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll get yeah the ground bison with heart and liver, and I'll thaw it, with some butter and honey and cayenne, and I'll get around. And a lot of times I'll have it with sourdough bread or crackers. You can have it just straight, but it tends to be have a lot of fat and protein and not have some some bread or crackers to like help it go down. I would think with the sourdough bread it would be standard. It is. And I'll, and I'll throw some salt, I'll throw some public sea salt or Himalayan sea salt. I'll also get, I'll actually get pretty creative these days with it. I'll throw some sauerkraut in with it. sauerkraut. And especially if I'm not going to eat the whole thing at once, the sauerkraut makes me feel better about letting it sit for a while in the fridge because it's got the bacteria to help protect the meat from bad bacteria and it'll even ferment it a little bit further, break it down a little bit more. Um, fermentation, we haven't talked a lot about it, but it's like pre-digestion. What happens in fermentation is what's going on in your gut, but we have a very short gut compared to like cow, cow's got four stomachs, uh, and most animals. We, if we were to eat grass, we're not going to get much out of it because we don't have the capabilities to digest it. So it's great to ferment things ahead of time. So anyway, so I'll, so I'll add sauerkraut to it, as well as some of the juice of the sauerkraut. So you said Maddox? Maddox Farms. At the 
farmers market. Farmers market. They're excellent. Really nice people. Do you put an egg in it? Yeah. So. Correct. Oftentimes, when steak tartare is served, you serve it with the raw egg yolk. And you do that? I do that sometimes. Uh, yeah, when convenient, I'll do that. I'll separate out the egg white to save to cook later. Um, or right then, I'll cook up the egg white. Maybe even throw that in there too. Like, you can get, you can get crazy with it. Uh, I'll often add a lot of spice. I love it to be really spicy. You could throw some chopped up onion and chives, different things. But uh, the core components are meat, butter, honey, cayenne, some salt for flavor, and, and, and we don't really get into it a lot in this class, but quality sea salt has lots of micronutrients, something like 80 some minerals that help with digestion. Uh, salt isn't the bad guy, it's like all these things. If it's over processed and it's just sodium chloride, then it's the enemy, then it can, you can get way too much real fast. But uh, quality salt is important for digestion, so I add salt to everything. The salt in uh, a really common thing that I do is raw milk or kefir or yogurt with raw egg yolks with a little bit of sweetener. So it's like a raw egg yolk, raw milk smoothie, and I love it. It's like my recovery shake after after class. Okay. okay, so quick little rundown of traditional. Uh, uh, what am I looking for? Uh, signs of a traditional diet versus signs of a modern diet. So uh, traditional, so I'll go left, right, traditional, modern. So foods from fertile soil, foods from depleted soil, animals raised on pasture, animals raised in confinement, bone broths, MSG and artificial flavoring, so cheating to get that flavor, rather than actual nutrients, glycoaminoclyte cans, like a full array of nu nutrients making that taste good. Uh, MSG, monosodium glutamate, is a natural marker for good nutrition, but we're able to just make it and throw it in. So it's the marker without the great nutrition, and it tricks your brain. And, that's, and so MSG and vegetable oils and sugar are typically what makes a processed food taste good. If it didn't have those things, it tastes like crap. All right, organ meats over muscle meat. So wanting the organ meats, you might have some muscle meat too. Uh, muscle meats and few to none organ meats. Uh, raw and or fermented dairy products, pasteurized, cooked uh, dairy products, uh, unrefined sweeteners, honey, maple syrup, uh, in lowish proportions, like it's better because it's a wider variety of nutrients which help you deal with the gut glycation and the bad things that come with sugar, uh, refined artificial sweeteners, ar uh, refined sugar, animal fats, vegetable oils, uh, soaked and or fermented grains, uh, refined extruded grains, what else do we want to go into? Uh, Lacto-fermented vegetables, canned, frozen vegetables, um, traditional cooking, microwave oven, uh, unrefined salt, refined salt, uh, traditional seeds, taking good care of them, not overheating them, and preparing them right. Uh, we have GMO seeds and, and you know, turning those into vegetable oil. We're almost done. Thanks for bearing with me. Uh, this is a very common site in China of a, a, a typical meal. A whole bunch of different dishes. So variety, talk about variety. Uh, you've got typically at least one soup, maybe two soups, usually with some bone-in meat. So you're getting those bone nutrients. Uh, and, and a lot of the meat in general, typically they just cut it up on the bone. You can eat around the bone. And you be very careful because there can be bone, bone pieces that you can chip your tooth on. So you very carefully eat around the bone, suck out the marrow, um, gnaw on the joints. If it's soft enough, eat the actual bone. Uh, and, they, and then they typically have a plate. Everyone has their own little plate. And that's, where you, that's not for getting your own food. That's for, that's actually kind of root. You spit out the bones, you put the seashells, and you put all the garbage on your plate. That's what the little saucer is for. And then some rice to help it go down. A little bit of, little bit of sugar to help with digestion. It's carbohydrates. And they'll often have fermented vegetables or sauces to go with it to help with digestion. Um, you got the whole, the whole fish, they cook the whole fish with the head on and the bones in, even the tail, whereas we cut that off, we don't get a lot of those nutrients. Um, yeah. Okay. That's actually my preferred method to eat. I love to eat like that. Isn't that fun? And, and family style. Yeah. Yeah. So here in the U.S., we pick one thing that has a side or two. 
and we only eat that. And over there, they cook all these different things, and they all pick from it with their chopsticks, and and they just get. It. And they, and they say like, the more people you eat with, the healthier it is, because the wider variety of dishes. And uh, yeah, I love it. It's super, fun, super nice to eat like that. Okay, this is a bunch of helpful websites. You can take a picture, take notes. So there's eatwild.com. That one. I think that's a lot of like local resources as well as localharvest.org, um, local farmers, local. Sorry, let me make a part in there. Walk around. There is rawmilk.com, so you can find local producers of raw milk and go straight to their farms. There are other farms you can go to by milk around here, but uh, as far as I know, just about all of them have to go there to get it. Uh, I did find frozen goat milk in a pet shop. And Interesting. Bountiful. Uh, and uh, I think it was uh, it's kind of spendy. They didn't say it was specifically for animals, but I think it was like animals, humans, whoever. Let's see, Slow Food USA, slowfood.usa.org. Um, I think that one's like finding community, finding like, like minded people who know about the importance of quality ingredients and traditional food preparation techniques. And then find the spring is really cool. You find free water coming out of the ground uh, with, you know, it's good, good natural pH and, and minerals in the water and all that. North Ogden? Well, you, yeah, you can find them all over. So there's one in North Ogden. I think you know, I know the one you're talking about. You're talking about a specific one? Yeah. What are the stores surrounding it? There's one big store right by it. Lee's Market. Lee's Market. Yeah, there's a grocery store right there, yeah. Yeah, so Lee's Market... Uh, if you're if you're looking at Lee's Market and behind the parking lot, off to the right, there's this big old is it a fake tree? Where there's like a big old. I've been there for a long time. I think it's like a fake tree, and then it's got like two spouts coming out, and it's just always firing out natural spring water. You just go fill up your fill up your water jugs. And uh, so there's that one. That one's a little bit further away from here. The one I often go to, I kind of like the exercise involved. There's one up the canyon at the trailhead of 47th Street. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you go. So if you're looking up the mountain at the trailhead, you take the path to the right, the main path. You go on there for a while. Uh, there's a little path that goes around the trees that meet back up. So right when you go there, either way, go down the down the path. Uh, it's kind of hard to describe. Go to uh, findthespring.com and follow the instructions. Uh, there's after a while, there's a path on your left, and if you stop and listen real closely, you can hear like the trickling of like a stream. That's the path you take. <laughs> sorry, sorry for not. There's like no better way to describe it. You go up there a ways, and you'll run into a a pipe shooting out of the ground and creating a stream, and you can just fill your water bottles up there. Bit of a hike, but it's kind of kind of. Mm, let's see. Recommended brands. You scan the QR code if you want. Um, yeah, so anyone who wants to scan that QR code, feel free. These are things like Bubby's, uh, fermented foods at Winco. Sorry to keep making you. Know, no, it's all good. Things come around. So this is just a PDF on my, on my Google Drive. And there's Bubby's, fermented foods. There's, uh, what else are like? Oh, uh, Pacific Food. Yeah. Specific something, I think specific foods for uh, bone broth is a good brand. Oh, cool little fun uh, traditional food hack that I found is Pacific Foods sells these these um, containers of bone broth used for cooking and stuff. It's around like five bucks. You can get the same amount of broth in individual cartons. Worst for the environment, sorry. So you get individual uh, single servings. And you can like take one of those to work. It's like the drink cheaper than most soft drinks. And then you can warm it on the stove if you have a stove at work, or you can put it in the microwave, maybe in a cup first, it might be a little bit of oil inside. Or you can throw it on your dashboard for an hour and warm it up that way. You can drink warm broth, and I do that often too, especially after a lot of climbing. It's a good, good way to build back up those joints that slowly break down over time. Yeah, I feel like my joints are breaking down. Bone broth. Yeah. Bone broth. And Crock-Pot. Yeah, yeah, use a crock-pot. Yeah, you can just put like a whole chicken in there and then the bones and add more water and cook it. And the brothel gelatinized. 
Yeah. <laughs> if you get options for like a high for three hours versus like low for eight hours, if you've got the time that you plan ahead, do low for eight hours. Because those bones, those nutrients in those bones take a while to unpack and come out. And the joints take a while to break down. Um, yeah, or, or pot roast with bone in is another good option. Chop up meat with the bone in, all that kind of stuff. Sorry to keep making me get up. Uh, <laughs> local producers. Oh, uh, this you don't. Oh, this is a cool thing. So there's something we talked about. Weston Price. So, this is another one. Sorry. This is uh, Weston. A Price was that dentist who went around the world. There's the Weston Price Foundation. This is another thing for community and resources and uh, like-minded people. And this is the Morgan County Resource List. I wish I had one for more of Ogden or Salt Lake, but I mean, Morgan County's not too far away. This is like a nine-page document with local farmers producing all kinds of stuff, from eggs to meat to maybe milk to uh, different fruits and vegetables. And a uh, really cool resource. And it's got most of them. It's got their phone number, it's got their address, like, you can see where they are, you can see what they're doing. So, really neat. My siblings have lived in Morgan County for many years. They didn't know about almost any of these. So a lot of these are real, real well hidden, but they want to be known. They want to sell their goods. And, and you don't have to go to market to get them, so you'll get a much better price than you would with like a, a 